We just passed Earth Overshoot Day, and it came early this year. That might sound like something to strive for. Soberingly, it's the opposite. August 1st marked the date when humanity's demand for ecological resources in 2018 exceeded what the Earth can regenerate this year. We maintain this deficit by using up stocks of ecological resources and accumulating waste, primarily carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The premise is simple, Earth's resources are limited. Earth's overshoot day is like a report card. Are we using our natural resources wisely and sustainably? At the moment, not so much. In 2018, it would take 1.7 Earths to replenish the natural resources we will collectively use up as a planet. Unfortunately, we only have one Earth. What's mainly causing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? The vast majority, around 97% of climate scientists agree that our planet is warming and that human activities are the primary cause. Mostly, it's a nagging dependence on fossil fuels. This topic can seem daunting, perhaps fear-inducing, worrying. I was listening to the light radio network on Friday, and they were saying, what's the difference between worrying and having concern? Jesus says, don't be worried. Does that mean we shouldn't have concern? And, and the response was, well, worrying is about yourself, self-centeredness, and, it, and it's based on fear. But concern is based on compassion and loving one another. So I think we can have concern without worry. We can be concerned about others in the earth. So I find myself constantly asking myself, what, if anything, can I personally do to make a difference? And how does this fit with my identity as a believer in Jesus Christ? What I'm doing here, talking about climate change, is a critical first step. I don't think Christianity and science are mutually exclusive. On the contrary, I know God created science in all of its minute and magnificent details. There is a place for both science and faith. Science and faith work together very well, John Abram explains. Science tells us about the world as it is and will be. Faith informs our inquiries about why. Science keeps faith from superstition, and faith helps us make us human. So I wonder, why are we as Christians in the United States so hesitant and apprehensive to enter into the discussion about climate change? To simply talk about climate change, especially in church, feels so taboo. Pastor Jim even cautioned me, don't get too political about it, and I won't, don't worry. Only to say that we hear about climate change in such politically divided terms that, is, that it has become synonymous with identifying ourselves politically. We're naturally suspicious people in the realm of politics. So even when we're faced with overwhelming scientific evidence, we don't want to believe it because it can feel like a political concession. It's not a political concession though. The fact that our climate is changing and hurting and killing people around the world is a sad reality based on facts, real data. Scientists don't base their findings on opinion or belief. Scientists are inherently skeptical in the truest sense of the word. They question everything and have their peers review their work. They're not afraid to question each other and themselves and admit when they're wrong. Science is never settled. As new observations are made and theories tested, science zigs and zags towards truth. It's all part of the scientific method that you learned about in high school. Science is a tool, a way of observing and measuring everything around us to create even better tools for our toolbox. We didn't come out of the Stone Age because we ran out of stones. We came out of the Stone Age because we found a better way forward. Which is why I agree, agree with Catherine Hayhoe, an evangelical Christian and an atmospheric scientist, when she says, people ask me if I believe in global warming. I tell them, no, I don't, because belief is faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Science is evidence of things that are seen. 
that can be observed, that are quantifiable. To have an open mind, we have to use the brains that God gave us to look at the science. In other words, you don't have to believe in climate change because it's a proven scientific fact. It's not about belief or p opinion. It's about acknowledging the data, taking time to understand the science, and being mindful of what's happening worldwide, connecting the dots, and making decisions based on the best available evidence. The evidence of climate change, what we can observe, test, and track is compelling and growing daily. Some of the smartest minds on the planet are telling us to sit up and pay attention. Our faith, which falls outside the scientific method, binds us to our creator. But that doesn't mean that we ignore 97% of climate experts any more than we'd ignore 97% of cardiologists or teachers or engineers. So here I am as a scientist who is also a Christian, and I think about the fact that the Bible begins and ends with a garden. Refer to Genesis chapter 2 and Revelation 22. Shouldn't this make us sit up and take note that there's something important about a garden, something that tells us God values the relationship between his people and the rest of his creation? If one of the ways God reveals himself to people is through his creation, doesn't it stand to reason that we should share in his high value of caring for the environment? It's almost incredulous that we meet God in creation, but haven't made the connection that caring for creation nurtures our relationship with him. Ultimately, creation's love and care is the biblical responsibility of God's people. As we heard this morning, God's first commands in Genesis chapter one to humanity was to tend his garden. To borrow from the poet Wendell Berry, God made the world because he wanted it made. He thinks the world is good and he loves it. It is his world. He has never relinquished title to it. If God loves the world, then how might any person of faith be excused for not loving it or justified in destroying it? As the Reverend Dr. Christopher Wright states in The Mission of God, we cannot have a relationship with God if we fail to care for what belongs to him. If the greatest commandment is that we love God, that surely implies that we should treat what belongs to God with honor, care, and respect. To love God, even to know God at all, Jeremiah would add, see Jeremiah 9.24, means to value what God values. And yet we're failing to tend his garden and value what God values. Clearly, we're not acting as stewards of creation. Pope Francis understands this, to perhaps a surprising level of scientific detail. To quote from his 2015 encyclical on climate change and inequality, quote, the climate is a common good belonging to all and meant for all. At the global level, it is a complex system linked to many of the essential conditions for human life. A very solid scientific consensus indicates that we are presently witnessing a disturbing warming of the climate system. In recent decades, this warming has been accompanied by rising sea levels, and it would appear by an increase of extreme weather events, even if a scientifically determinable cause cannot be assigned to each particular phenomenon. Humanity is called to recognize the need for changes in lifestyle, production, and consumption in order to combat this warming, or at least the co human causes which produce and aggravate it. It is true that there are other factors, such as volcanic activity, variations in the Earth's orbit and axis, the solar cycle, yet a number of scientific studies indicate that most global warming in recent decades is due to the great concentration of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrogen oxides, and others, released mainly as a result of human activity. The problem is aggravated by a model of development based on the intensive use of fossil fuels, which is at the heart of the worldwide energy system. <clears throat> Climate change is a global problem with grave implications, environmental, social, economic, and political. It represents one of the greatest challenges facing humanity in our day. Its worst impact will probably be felt by developing countries in coming decades." Unquote. This sounds scary, but we don't need to be fearful. There is literally good news, the gospel. We have a guidebook. The Bible emboldens and directs us. 
In Psalm 82, verse 4, David encourages the reader to take care of the poor and needy. Your job is to stand up for the powerless and to prosecute all those who exploit them. Paul implores the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 4, don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Matthew 25 instructs us to care for the least of these. Micah tells us to walk humbly with our God. The Bible is clear and simple. We're to love God as God loves, and we must care and empower the poor. Our changing climate simply makes Jesus' commands harder. The overarching principle in all of this is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I believe there are two key words here, love and world. Often we may mentally substitute all people for the word world when reciting this passage, but St. John used the Greek word cosmon. God so loved the cosmon. He could have used the word anthropos, God so loved humanity, but he chose a word that means God loved the cosmos, the creation, and everything who dwell in it. And I believe God's love for his creation is also reflected in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. To quote blogger Kimberly Hunt, who is with the MICA Challenge, a global Christian campaign to end extreme poverty, here's what she said. Are we going to ignore the science just because of political ideology or inconvenience? You might say that the laws, regulations, and plans right now aren't doing anything to stop or reverse the effects of climate change and are just serving to hurt the economy. But at least we're doing something. At least we've recognized part of the problem. At least we've taken some steps to address the issue. I don't want to leave it at at least. I want us to be fearless and able to tell the generations after us that we saw the problem and took steps to fix it so that they would have a chance. I want to be part of the generation that seeks answers and innovates. I want to be able to talk to someone who lost their home in a wildfire, that I know there is a problem and I'm working my hardest to help find a solution. Don't you? So how should Christians respond to climate change? One, let us pray. Two, let us look at how our own lives, let us look at our own, how we live our own lives and how we might, it might be affecting the environment. Let us seek innovation. Let us seek alternative options for energy. And let us advocate for those currently living in extreme poverty who are facing climate change as a life-threatening issue every single day. To, to conclude, again, from the Pope's encyclical, enlighten those who possess power and money that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which we live. The poor and the earth are crying out.